Some, may, many of you hopefully will be familiar with the McKinsey Report, Reinventing Construction, uh, and I'd recommend it if you, if you want. Um, it's been a really influential report in the construction industry, certainly here in the UK in the last year. It's published in February, and it, it really gets into the, the, the productivity problem that the construction industry has. And while the government and industry are waking up here to that, um, I think it's telling that this report reveals it's a worldwide phenomenon, and that some of the problems that we report on in construction use on a daily and a weekly basis are the exact same problems being experienced around the world um, by various, in various countries in, in the construction sector. Construction is among the least, most digitized sectors in the world, uh, and Europe is the, the least digitized sector. And, and what that means short term is that there's a lot to be done, but it does offer at least some medium term potential to add far greater value and to do things in a better way. Here to tell us more is McKinsey Senior Fellow and Contributing Author to, to Reinventing Construction, Jan Mishka. Jan, hopefully I got your surname right, is that spot on? Jan's going to give a presentation, after which time we'll have a bit of time for Q&A. Jan. So. Thank you very much for, for the introduction, and it's a uh, factor. So it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here um, and be with the VCs and construction tech people who are really now at the verge of reshaping this industry. So I'm, I'm so excited to, about being here because this industry is at an inflection point. This is changing as we speak. I don't think anyone can predict, or at least I can't predict, whether it's going to be changing over the next three years or over the next 30 years. <laughs> but it is changing now, it is starting to change now. Um, and digital is one of the big drivers of that change, but also one of the big necessi necessities for that change and one of the big opportunities. Um, so wh wh why do I actually think this industry is such an inflection point, and what is that? How, how is it going to evolve? Let's look maybe at a few things in terms of the sector and its dynamics, in terms of the improvement opportunities, and then in terms of how the technology and digital plays into that. So first, the productivity problem that was already mentioned. If you look at labor productivity in construction, this one stops here, so there's also disruption. <laughs> It's not very digital. <laughs> so it's essentially been flatlined for two decades. Um, and if you paint that picture further back in countries like the US, it's actually been flatlining, flatlining for half a century. That's essentially unheard of in any other industry. You can discuss a little bit the measurement issues, latest estimates said might be might have looked a bit better than it shows here, but it will not have looked great. Uh, so let's keep there. It's been a miserable industry by many standards. But as miserable as it has been, it's also large. So we had nine and a half or 10 trillion dollars roughly in volume, going to grow to about 16 or 15 to 16 over the next 12, 13 years. So it's fast growing. And the, um, with that size, actually the gap in productivity between construction and average economy, not even stalking about sectors like manufacturing, is worth 1.6 trillion dollars a year. That is half the global annual infrastructure spend. So but just by doing things better, not hiring a single additional person, we could build half the world's infrastructure. And I'm not talking close half the world's infrastructure gaps, it's really half the entire infrastructure we need. So that's, that's the size of the price here. And I will show you that it's actually what's possible. It's not a wishful thinking, so this can be done, this can be bridged. It's also a very diverse sector, and I guess all of you will probably be active in very different aspects and bits and pieces of construction. And just to highlight one element of that diversity is now we have some of the different subsectors of construction plotted against productivity growth versus productivity level. And then you see a couple of subsectors are fairly, fairly a bit better, like oil and gas, heavy industrial, and so on, where uh, there has been a longer term push for putting the best engineers on and standardizing here and there a little bit. But even that, if you compare that to automotive, uh, that, that's quite a distance. And if you then go further down into areas like often dominated by fragmented smaller trade subcontractors and plumbing, HVAC, electrical, and so on, it's really low levels and often negative growth and productivity. And I think that's also important to keep in mind if you in terms of whom you are addressing, all those subcontractors um, sub and fragmented trades matter a lot 
for this performance and also matter a lot for changing the picture. So what is behind that low productivity in that sector? We use a framework to, to look at the productivity in sectors looking at it doesn't only end, it also <laughs> moves. <laughs> this is uh, productivity and construction as its best. Um, so it's, we start with the, uh, looking actually at what, what's happening at firms, it's firm level operational factors. How are firms at the front line performing? That is, of course, what matters eventually for productivity. But then ask why, and again, why and why. So, why is that working the way where they do in terms of the industry dynamics that drive it? And why are the industry dynamics what they are by looking at external forces and regulation and so on? And then we had a survey among about some 250 or so um, CEOs, among contractors, owners, suppliers around the world to get a sense on relative ranking of, of the reasons of what's happening. And not, not to go into, into all of them, but in terms of the um, external forces, Increasing projects and site complexity is what comes out top in that survey. Um, and to give you a sense of that, 21% of all spend globally now is in projects greater than $1 billion. Those are complex projects, and by all statistics, they end up with lower productivity performance than smaller ones. While another about 50% of spend is in maintenance and refurbishment, which usually has even lower productivity than the big projects. So there is kind of uh, there is of course a, sh a shift in how this industry is set up, but more importantly and, and actually easier to act on are some of the industry dynamics, and the key one that sticks out here are the contracting and incentive structures. So people point to mistrust, litigious culture, lowest cost, single shootout, tendering scenarios that then get followed up with claims and all kinds of hostile behavior on contractor versus owner site rather than collaborative improvement and innovation. And to put it into the words of one CEO whom we interviewed, he just said, well, if I see a tender a bit coming my way, where the design is, just makes no sense, where the project plan is ill-conceived, I go in at all costs because I know it's going to be a mess and really profitable. <laughs> so we gotta start there, for sure. I think the other thing is are more among the, the firm level, um, where then the design processes are in, and, and investments often match the somewhat ill-conceived contracting and incentive structures. So it's either starting with too little planning, that's usually the case, and then you change it afterwards and get into all kinds of met. And in some cases, too much planning and not really appropriately, appropriately accounting for risks, and then it's also not going to work out well. Or, um, then the poor project management and execution on site, and I think the few of the firms here actually look at how you actually really optimize workforce deployment on site, uh, collaboration, and so on. So these are some of the key issues, with then, of course, as already highlighted, the lack of digitization and the general lack of investment. This industry invests at roughly a third the rate of other industries on average. It's just a very capital light industry as it stands. So what to do about that? That's of course the more interesting question. So we have understood the issues now. Uh, what to do about it? Can something be done? Yes, it can. So we actually did a bottom-up assessment along seven levers um, and what they could contribute to solving that issue, also quantitatively. And it so happens that the range 48 to 60 percent improvement is roughly in line with the gap we would need to close to average economic performance levels. So it can be done. And the, the aspects that contributed Start with regulation, speeding up permitting uh, processes, harmonizing building codes. Um, in many cases, actually also mandating technology. You will all have experienced mandatory uses of, of BIM and, and the like. Then it's about collaboration and contracting and getting out of this hostile culture. Um, either the simpler things in terms of adjusting the little bit little uh, nitty-gritties along the incentive structures in the contract, particularly in public procurement going to multi-round bidding based on best value rather than lowest cost, or actually going a step further to integrate a project delivery, really kind of being in one boat together, contractor and owner, to optimize things. Design and engineering, 
in many cases, just investing more. Don't invest 3%, invest 8 to 10% of project building into design and engineering. It will pay off. Uh, but then more specifically, design to value mechanisms, the cross-contractor and design and engineering firm and owners combined. You need to optimize across the entire chain, and you can. Supply chain management, about 50% of the cost is in materials usually. So centralized procurement, standardization, and so on are some of the tools that can make a difference. On-site execution, all the workforce deployment, lean construction techniques, construction flow balancing, on-time delivery of materials to the room rather than to the site, and so on to decouple some of the materials mess that often happens. <coughs> Capability building, to go here first, um, very important. Capabilities are often not there. So the right apprenticeship progress, but also just the ramp up on big projects, seeing where will the capability gaps be, where can I get the guys, how much ramp up time do I give them before construction starts. And then, of course, technology. And we will talk much more about that. This is what that is, of course, in a, throughout this afternoon. But maybe to, to also highlight one thing, if you think the 14 to 15 percent is too low a number, now this is a number of what is achievable globally across all areas of construction. So individual projects can easily double at more productivity rates, just this productivity. But that number then gets scaled down, of course, to what our different geographics and industry experts seem realistic as the penetration of technology 10 years out. And that gives you that. 14 to 15 percent global opportunity. And if you want that, if you want that in dollar numbers, it's roughly a third of the heterogeneity, so about 500 billion dollars a year improvement potential from technology. So about, what, what about technology? It is indeed the least digitized sector after agriculture, notably after agriculture. Uh, just think about that. <laughs> Uh, and it is also the one that has grown productivity um, the least. But what could happen there? What are the areas where technology is changing the sector uh, or beginning to change? And we will hear lots of examples throughout the day. So there's essentially a lot of activity around, I would say, computer vision. You add more computer vision on drones or rovers or so, and then you have near perfect site surveying before construction or site surveying during construction to know the S build and, and really what's going on and where are the potential areas of conflict. Um, next generation of BIM, we go 3D to 5D to 6D, 7D, and we'll probably continue. I'm sure we will see 10D and 12D, uh, whatever, but this is usually core to increasing number of construction projects and a lot of construction companies are actually now also kind of starting to dissect their organizations a bit into the traditional part, and then there's the digital part that tries to work this entire chain, and hopefully that one grows and the other one shrinks. Digital project collaboration and mobility, making sure the workforce on site goes ahead uh, in, a, in a smart and lean and efficient way. The Internet of Things and advanced analytics, that's getting all the data you have on construction sites, but also then later on in building operations and maintenance, analyzing them to see where you can optimize. One example, for instance, in crossrail sensors in the earth actually massively reduced the amount you need for stabilization of the surface area uh, by early detection on where there are movements and so on that, that require action. And then changing how you work in terms of materials and construction mobilities and going to a much more industrialized setup of the industry. And just very briefly highlight two examples in slightly more depth that are hopefully not overlapping with, with what we hear afterwards. One is the it's kind of the, the, the vision uh, near perfect surveying. This is an example, uh, I think it's a Canadian player actually, Vero, creating a digital twin with a drone mounted uh, computer vision, exactly millimeter precision identification, what is happening on site, then you can actually compare what is on site versus what is the other materials that are supposed to be mounted, where are their deviations, where would, would I need them to go back to the factory and tell them, actually make this pipe 1.3 centimeters shorter, and this way save the welder, who actually afterwards then needs to cut the pipe and, and weld it because it didn't fit. 
So just, just one example. And the other example is Barcelona housing systems from Barcelona, in fact, moving to a completely industrialized construction approach that doesn't go to site and puts brick on brick, but essentially puts a factory on a site where 30,000 housing units go up. And it's 30,000, pretty much the same units from the inside. They all look a bit different from outside so that it isn't so ugly. Um, but the, the, the interesting bit here is, of course, the cost savings, but also the time savings, targeting some six days or so to erect a building like this one. Uh, but also all the sustainability requirements that are so much easier to achieve if you already ex ante fit all the dual piping for groundwater harvesting and um, all the things you can do, a solar panel on the roof integrated rather than mounted ex post and so on. But this industry, I mean, it hasn't been changing for the last half century and some people would say for the last century or century and a half. So why would it change now? Is it going to change now or are we just hopeful that it might change at some point and will never? Now we actually think it will change now over the next X years and no one knows the X. And here are some of the reasons why. It's on the demand side. We just have escalating demand throughout the world. It's kind of some of the urbanization going on in emerging economies that make us literally rebuild the planet over the next 10, 15 years in terms of volume of construction going on. Huge infrastructure gaps, 0.5% of GDP roughly a year in terms of missing investments. The increasing complexity I spelled out earlier that raises the demand and raises the bars. Affordable housing challenges, 440 million households will be unable to afford decent housing by 2025. And I should add here also the sustainability requirements that add just further to the complexity and make it so much more difficult uh, to meet demands with traditional techniques. And then on the other side, the technologies are starting to be there. We learn about that. There's more and more global players there. So it's nice if you have been your cozy UK-based player for some time, but the Chinese are not waiting for you to stay in your market. They might conquer it. They come, might come after you. Uh, the innovative techniques like the Barcelona housing system uh, in terms of the production methodologies rather than the um, technologies and then also digital marketplace players that can take down cost, put some pressure on suppliers particularly, but also either make the life of contractors easier or more complex depending on where you sit. So lots of things on the supply and demand side that are changing and that make me believe we are at an inflection point and you will all make the change. Thank you. Thanks, Jan. Stay here. We'll, we've got time for maybe one or two questions, guys. Just yeah, stay away from that panel. You're giving me a heart attack every time. Yeah. <laughs> and we should have a roving mic. Mel has a roving mic. Would anyone like, like to ask Jan any questions about his presentation on reinventing construction? I'll kick off in case anyone's shy. Jan, are there any outliers? Are there any international examples where they're bucking this trend in terms of construction? Or is this is just you know this is just a worldwide phenomenon that construction needs to shape up across the globe? High level, it's a worldwide phenomenon. It's it's pretty universal that it needs to reshape. Um, there are pockets where things are, are moving. Uh, so you see, for instance, in China, it's still kind of if you look at the levels of productivity, it's quite low. But it is the country where the rate of improvement has been seven to nine percent a year for twenty years in a row. Uh, and if you think of some of the industrialization, you know, 8,000 kilometers of high-speed rail with tunnel launching machines and so on, it's a different way of constructing than what we see in this city. Um, and you see kind of pockets here and there also um, in Singapore moving ahead or explicitly moving ahead in a lot of the regulatory action that is needed and will trigger change eventually, probably. Uh, when you talked about the different different parts of the industry being further ahead, uh, it seemed to me like civils was maybe in a better place than traditional buildings is, and, and property. Is that is that right in terms of what's going on? Uh, the, the, num the numbers suggest so. Uh, the numbers suggest so. And then uh, th there's, of course, an element of a lot of the civil um, building, in a way, being also almost quarter quarter a bit simpler. Right? So there's a lot of earth moving, so and you usually do take big machinery for the earth moving. Um, there is increasing use of also um, automated vehicles, self-driving vehicles and so on for the towering and so on. So there's a little bit more 
uh, I would say, in that space. But it's also quite a wide field. Eh? You will also see a lot of good old civil infrastructure being built in a very, very low productivity way with 20 person shops uh, with a shop around. You talked about um, tech accounting for maybe you know, 500, um, 500 billion in terms of annual, annual kind of the, the gain, so to speak, in terms of that productivity. Um, how much is that? How much of that should be led by government? I think you touched on the fact that you know this, this BIM mandate, which certainly created uh, it created a, a, you know a small industry in the, in the UK in terms of mandating level two BIM. How much of that should be led by the, the regulatory environment that's set by government, and how much of this should be a private sector led? So, uh, in principle, in terms of the technology technological advances that will come from the private sector. Um, but, and that might be a relatively unusual thing to say for someone from an institution like McKinsey, I think there is a case for some robust government intervention here. And that links back particularly to these misaligned um, uh, contracting structures and the, the industry dynamics that are just flawed and that have historically persisted now for half a century. So it seems just by observation difficult for the industry to break out of the dynamic that pushes the entire sector down and essentially it's all of us as users, as, as residents and houses and users of infrastructure with the, uh, with the pitfalls. This uh, pie chart, is a different categories uh, that will lead to improvements in construction. Which of those categories do you feel most comfortable with having impact in the next few years? Uh, you mean the one with, with regulation and capabilities or the, uh, the technological areas? The circle with five uh, different. Uh, um, this one, yes. Um, it, it is a good question. It is a good question. I don't. I don't think that I would have the answer in terms of what it will be because the reality is kind of. If I look at my. If I look at, at, at my colleagues who are working with big contractors in digital transformations, they are working in all these areas. There's a lot of activity in each and every one of those single areas. What of those is, the, is going to be the biggest impact? I don't know. <laughs> Three. <laughs> Would you say that the way contracts are um, defined now, like PPPs, uh, PPMs, and so on, are putting pressure on the different stakeholders to work more closely together in order to basically work on those five areas together? Um, is that, it's not really government pushed, but it's more a trend that we see even though uh, there's some hiccups also in some of these contracts, but bottom line, this is where the most innovations are coming. I think that, I think that is actually another trigger, um, in the sense that I'm, I'm probably also a little bit less of a fan of PP, at least, uh, if, if, if you will, than uh, a lot of other observers in the industry. I think there's a lot of waste of money going on and just kind of throwing pretty high interest rates at a deal that you could finance at zero public interest rate. Um, but I do actually agree that there is quite a bit of additional discipline coming out from setting up the PPPs properly from the financial investors who actually look at the contract structure with a different lens than the traditional owner versus contractor hostility. And um, in many cases, there's, there's quite a bit of efficiency coming out in terms of the actual construction that goes through. Final question with the agenda. Um, Andy from Multiflex, uh, multinational construction company. Um, I just wanted to mention that digital and construction techs become the centre of our strategy recently, and it, but it did take quite a quite a amount of effort and time to convince a lot of the leadership that that was the way forward. Um, and it's still we still will face a lot of resistance with other people within our business, but we're currently it's actually driving a lot of our strategy going forward. Are you finding that you're getting, firstly, a lot more inquiries from contractors globally? And then secondly, you know, is the resistance still strong um, with like middle management? It's actually a, a very good, good question. Um, 
So, yes and yes, both, both apply fully. Uh, to give you some flavor to that, I, I probably spoke about the results of this work to now some 50 odd construction CEOs and senior executives, so kind of 50 companies. Uh, so most of the biggest in the world probably collectively as a team of authors. The, the, the kind of, the, the sense of urgency is there. Uh, there's, I would say a minority who thinks there's a huge opportunity out there, let's go after it. I would say there's a majority out there who's scared that someone is going to eat their cake. And I can only say someone is going to eat their cake because they don't change. And then there's, I don't know, 5% or so that who say, no, it's going to be fine and it's not going to happen, but it's kind of negligible. So and I think that, that for me is actually the strongest indicator why I really believe that this industry is changing. You can have all the analytics that are showed here, but the real indicator is if I speak to 50 of the top executives and they say, I'm going to change, they will change. Now, in terms of I will change, what does that mean? Well, I will change usually then means let's start with a strategy, find out what is the business case for BIM, well, we don't really know, let's test it. Well, our pilot was negative because we had double the investment because it was a pilot and, pilot and we didn't have the capabilities yet. So there's, there's a lot of the uh, resistance from, from really seeing the positive results on spot now compared to the clarity on the trajectory and vision going forward. Um, and there's also a lot of complexity in terms of executing on the transformation, a lot of uh, resistance, of course, um, construction managers who have worked one way for 40 years and have relatively limited appetite to change and maybe cannot change even, maybe you just need to replace them. <coughs> um, even, even all the way down to risks about the business model, where quite a few of those executives are also probably rightfully concerned that while this change is going to revolutionize the industry and leading to much higher productivity and degrees of professionality, it may not enhance their bottom line. It may help any of us buying our houses more than them as a company. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all we've got time for from Jan, so just show our appreciation the same way.